it's a very nice village, but it's a bit scattered. It's a bit scattered. Awfully scattered. It's a scattered com community. President, uh, what's your position on decriminalising homosexual acts in Liberia? I've already taken a position on that, that um, we're not going to sign any such law. To, you won't sign any law to decriminalise? I won't sign any law that has to do with that area, none whatsoever. We like ourselves just the way we are. And what about decriminalising the, the current law? Quite frankly, um, I'm not quite sure even if we're going to see a law go through our legislature on that, so I doubt it seriously. But at the moment, I mean, um, voluntary sodomy is illegal at the moment, so in essence homosexuality for two gay men under the books is illegal in Liberia. We've got certain traditional values in our society that we'd like to preserve. So you're saying you wouldn't decriminalize that current law? I've just said to you we're going to maintain our traditional values. Okay. Um, Mr. Blair, Ban Ki-moon has urged African leaders to stop treating gay people as second-class citizens and criminals Given that good governance and human rights go hand in hand, what is your advice to Madam President and, and Liberia on this gay rights issue? Yeah, one of the advantages of doing what I do now is that I can choose the issues I get into and the issues I don't. So, you know, for us, the priority is around power, roads, jobs, delivery. I'm not saying these issues aren't important for the President's given her position and this is not one for me. So good governance and human rights don't go hand in hand. Damson, you know how long I've been doing these types of interviews? I do right, okay. So <laughs> I'm not giving you an answer on it. So the AGI doesn't have a, a position on no, th advocating this is, that no, gay people should. AGI exists to try and support governments in getting their programs of delivery changed. Now, there'll be all sorts of different situations. You know, my record on this is well known. You can go back and re refer it back to it in the UK, but uh, it's not an issue for us here that we're working on. And I'm going to just restrict my comments to things that I'm, I'm working on. So I'm so not going to get... There two riots in Liberia over the AGI issue. Liberia has specific terms of reference. Mm -hmm. They're carrying out their function within those terms of reference. That's all we require of them. <laughs> I love... Uh... The look he gives the Guardian journalist. <laughs> Do you know how long I've been doing this, Lydia? I'll have you, I'll have you bloody removed from your position at once. <clears throat> now, the Dark Lord's been a very, very busy man, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, you will have seen him uh, during the uh, the coronation. Uh, well, not the coronation, but the the proclamation uh, of King Charles. Uh, he was there, um, muttering to uh, <laughs> to. Uh, to uh, Sir Keir Starmer and trying to avoid talking to Gordon Brown, which uh, which I enjoyed. But um, what about this bit of footage that has emerged? Let me let me show you this. You've done on this because, uh, as I know firsthand, when you try to push forward into this problem, you have a lot of people with a lot of ideas who are very quick to give criticism, not very quick to give you know constructive solutions. And the fact that you've been working on it for so long, I've learned a lot from what you've done, and we've we've definitely borrowed from a lot of your ideas. So I just want to thank you for all your efforts and for uh, everything you've done to try to make the world a better place. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, he, he's literally the king of the world, I'm telling you. <laughs> um, that was Jared Kushner uh, during uh, Trump's presidency, uh, you know, basically uh, hailing, the, hailing the Dark Lord. Um, also, uh, shortly before the Queen died, this, this happened. There he is, shaking hands with the president of Zimbabwe. Um, why Blair was in Zimbabwe? Who knows? But... Uh, this was a major public relations coup uh, for the president of Zimbabwe there. So uh, there we go. Um, but uh, what um, we would we would like to do 
uh, today, friends, is uh, he appeared at something called the Bled Strategic Forum on um, the <laughs> uh, on the uh, uh, yeah the Bled Strategic Forum on August the thirty first, um, uh, twenty twenty two. That was about twelve days ago. So before the sad passing of the Queen, which we'll be discussing tomorrow on Unpopular Opinions. But um, I really enjoyed this Blair kind of interview. It showed, I guess, a more human side of the Dark Lord. He, he was very much in kind of let his hair down mode. And he was a bit less guarded than he often is uh, in this particular interview. Maybe he thought nobody was watching or something. But um, I've noticed an awful lot of people have, have watched this interview, 82,000 people watched it over at the Tony Blair Institute. So it got bigger numbers than the average Blair speech. And I thought, well, this, I, I, I must do this one. And um, I know it's been 12 days, but I've been ill um, and I've been busy and there's been all sorts of things on. So tonight pretty much was the only uh, time I thought I could do it. So I was going to squeeze it in and here we are. So without further ado, uh, let's welcome the Dark Lord, Tony Blair. Uh, obviously, buy my courses, join the channel, get a mug, uh, buy the, the best-selling book, The uh, Populist Delusion. The Populist Delusion. There's a lot of great information and history in this book, and even a mystery trick that you can learn at the end. So take it from me, Kenneth Michael Benbow Blake. This is a great book to read, so pick it up at your local library now. Yep, uh, or you can get the uh, the Foundations of Politics, uh, on which that book is based, uh, the Trivium, there's all sorts of fantastic things uh, that you can be getting um, to support this channel. But um, now we're going to be getting on with watching Blair at the Blair Strategic Forum. Your seat so that we can get started. Uh... For everyone, uh, my name is Ali Hassan. I'm a Berlin-based international TV presenter and journalist. And for everyone who was here yesterday, I think you would concur and agree with me that the BSF 2022 got off to a very powerful, very emotional, very strong start. And I'm delighted to say that the second day is uh, equally starting on a very strong note. We're extremely delighted to be joined now by somebody who has shaped uh, European and global politics for a decade and continues to do so in... I, I should mention um, very quickly, by the way, that um, we were talking a bit earlier on in our little uh, private chat, and um, Farrow, uh, my sometime co-host on The Deepest Law, back before it became me and T talking about David Bowie every week, but uh, uh, he was saying that the, the World Economic Forum conspiracy is one of the one of the weaker conspiracies because i mean the world economic forum is just one of these conferences it just so happens to be an extremely high profile one but if you track the calendar of somebody like tony blair he is constantly speaking at these different strategic forums uh, of which the wef is only one so this, you know, something like this, the Bled Strategic Forum, and it's all the same sorts of people, um, but it's just not not run by the WEF. So I, I do think it's important to understand that the World um, Economic Forum is just one of these conferences. It's just the kind of the biggest one. Um, but these people, like, let, let's just say that the WEF, if the WEF ceased to exist tomorrow. Uh, Klaus Schwab, has, you know, as a car crash or something. Um, it's not like the machinations of these people would stop. It's not like the World Economic Forum in and of itself as an entity is that important. Um, it is just one of the places that globalists speak to each other. Okay, so that's just something to bear in mind. Um, and it's one of the reasons I like to do these Blair, you know, Dark Lord watches, to follow him, basically, to see where he goes, what who he's talking to. What, what are the sort of circles he's moving in, okay? Anyway, let's, let, let us continue. 
other capacity these days. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the former Pro uh, Prime Minister of Great Britain and Northern Ireland and the Executive Chairman of the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change, Tony Blair. Great to have you with us Thank here very much, Thank at you. the Blood Strategic Forum. Just to be uh, very clear and transparent, uh, because uh, Tony Blair got uh, knighted recently, so my first question to him backstage was, how do I address you? <laughs> I said, is it Sir Tony? Is it, and uh, he just said, call me Tony. So, uh, <laughs> so this is not a lack of respect quite on the... That, that was always Blair's calling card, by the way. Call me Tony. Call me Tone. You know, the uh, he's wearing a tie today, by the way. He's, he's decided, uh, but you know that was him, casual on the sofa. You know, I'm just a, I'm just a person, just like anyone else. You know, uh, he's he's still playing that game. The country delighted to have you with us, uh, Tony, here on stage talking about the very imminent and current challenges of our time. And uh, we have to start, of course, no surprise, with Ukraine. It dominated uh, the first day of the Blood Strategic Forum. It will certainly dominate the second one and many more to come, I, I'm afraid. When you were prime minister, Vladimir Putin came into power in 2000. And back then, I looked up some, some quotes of yours and some Western leaders. You were actually quite upbeat and optimistic that here is a Russian leader who gets the West, who is going to be a partner for the West and to the West. What went wrong? <laughs> <laughs> Quite a lot, um, <laughs> but, but before I do that, let me say how delighted I am to be at the forum. And uh, yeah, it, by all means, you call me Tony. If any of you want to see something truly amusing, you can look on the internet and find the picture of me when I got my knighthood, because this is a special knighthood. It's given by the Queen. It's been since 1340 in the UK, and I, by tradition. When you get the knighthood, you have to dress in the same outfit that they had in 1340. <laughs> There's nothing quite so absurd as looking <laughs> at yourself in a picture of 14th century costume. So if you want a good laugh, go and see you that. You know everybody's Googling it right now. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that's what you can do nowadays. Um, so Classic Blair, you know, nice touch, personable. Call me Tony, a little kind of self dep I mean it's not I wouldn't say self deprecating a kind of humble brag st story about his uh his knighthood and of course the 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 um foundations of rhetoric ladies and gentlemen the the Mick Foley cheap pop you know I uh, I'm I'm just glad I I just want to say how glad I am to be here with you know the people of uh, the people of Berlin yay <laughs> yeah so yeah, he always likes to compliment the venue as well Let's see what he's got to say for him. So interesting first question, uh, drawing attention to the fact that Blair was actually quite friendly with Putin back in the early 2000s. So let's see how he responds. No, when, when I first uh, met Vladimir Putin, at his insistence, we met in St. Petersburg, the western facing part of, of, of Russia. He was talking about the modernization of the Russian economy. He wanted a strong relationship with the West. I think I was the first European leader actually to go and, and see him. And, you know, I always say that is the, that was the first incarnation of, of President Putin that I, I knew. Then, as the years went on, it became increasingly clear that he turned away from economic reform and instead towards a form of nationalism. But that nationalism meant that he really destroyed the democracy within his own country. You can tell he's serious. The Blair Blades are out. The Blair Blades. See? That's the Blair Blade. That he really destroyed the democracy within his own country. It's true he had certain foreign adventures. Georgia, Crimea. But in that second incarnation that I, where I knew him, it was within fairly defined limits. And my anxiety, frankly, is that there is a third incarnation, which is um, brutal and based on a 
a fantasy because what has happened in Ukraine is, is not just unacceptable, but it's impossible ever for him to achieve what he wants to achieve. And I thought one of the great... I think this is interesting because many Ukraine shills that I argue with on Twitter, you know, people who are, you know, nominally on our side, uh, apart from this one conflict, but also, uh, you know, Tory boys and uh, various other regime stooges, use this exact line of argumentation that Blair is using here, that Putin is was actually a maniac now. He's actually mad because what he's trying to do is, quote unquote, impossible. Let's see how Blair justifies the claim that it's impossible. Great things about the conference yesterday, and it came through very strongly, obviously, in, in what Ursula von der Leyen said, is, you know, this act of aggression is shocking, but it has brought Europe together, and Europe will stick together. And by the way, for these purposes, I include Britain as part of Europe. Okay. <laughs> so we will stick together, and that aggression will not succeed. And I think he has grossly underestimated not just the determination of the Ukrainian people, but the determination of Europe. That aggression will not succeed. You say, I, I asked the very same thing to President Zelensky yesterday, who was as defined as ever, and he says, we will prevail, we will win uh, in the end. But realistically speaking, what would a win look like for Ukraine? Well, how this thing ends, I mean, I have from the very beginning said that we should have a dual strategy. The first should be to give Ukraine everything they need in terms of, of finance and weapons in order that they can defend themselves. The second is to do that in order to create eventually the scope for a, a, a negotiated settlement um, of the conflict. But it's got to be one that is not just in line with the aspirations and hopes of the Ukrainian people for the future, but one that does not reward Russian aggression. Now, how, what that in the end looks like is, is obviously going to be a matter for, for debate, but I, I, I can't see any basis for a negotiated end to this that in any shape or form rewards Russia or gives Russia anything for what it has done. Now, is that not the view of a total maniac? <laughs> How are you going to negotiate a settlement that gives Russia nothing? I mean, the only circumstance in which that would happen is if Russia completely lost this war. I mean, it may, I mean, let's just pretend Blair is right and it's completely impossible for Russia to win. How are Ukraine going to come to the point where they reach a negotiation position that doesn't give Russia anything it wants? This is the view of a lunatic, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, he's presenting himself as the sensible man in the room, as he always does, but I, I can't see how Blair has this view. I, I just don't see how they think they're going to push Russia to that position. What, I mean, what series of events would need to happen for Russia just to say, yeah, okay, um, you can have everything you want. We're going, to get, we're going to get nothing that we asked for. Impossible, absolutely impossible, especially uh, given that Russia are the invading force. Uh, I, I, just don't see, I just don't see how Blair's going to get this, but let's, let's see uh, where else he goes. The President Putin is also doesn't strike me, uh, and perhaps you as a politician who will go away quietly and concede defeat. No, that is true. And over the years, as he's shown and seen... Syria, he's, he's got huge staying power. But on the other hand... Oh, I forgot to unmute myself. So sorry. Um, I was just saying very quickly that... Um, I was just uh, saying very quickly that the Bowie stream that we did earlier on was um, taken down for copyright. It was blocked. 
I have disputed that, and we just need to wait for um, the outcome of the review. So it may be down for two or three days. Uh, sorry for my boomer for forgetting to unmute. This has been a massive miscalculation. The original, the original plan for sure was to topple the government and install a, a puppet government. That's failed. The ambition now, I think, is to keep as much of the, the south and west of Ukraine. But you know, as we can see from the offensive that's been launched now, it's, even that is in, in doubt. There are huge logistical problems. Uh, incidentally, that counteroffensive, um, he was talking about the one in Kursov, but there's since been one in Kharkov. Um, he was talking 12 days ago, of course. It's now 12 days later, and the Russians have um, suffered setbacks, uh, to say the least, in Kharkov. My understanding is that um, a force of about 15,000 strong, anywhere between nine and 15,000 on the Ukrainian side, um did a kind of raid down to Kharkov where there were only 2,000 Russians posted um and details have come out now that they did this owing to uh Western intelligence uh, US or British intelligence basically gave them that information so basically the 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 West are helping to backseat general this war now by feeding the Ukrainians intelligence as to where the Russians are thin. Um, so all I'm saying is, is that uh, there is some truth to the idea that Europe sticking together in the way that Blair is saying, and that the, you know, the US backing uh, Ukraine is giving it some, I mean, it's given them a tactical win, a battle. I mean, whichever way you look at it, the Kharkov offensive was a W, in the call in the uh, you know it was a win in the win-loss column for the ukrainians now obviously the war is far from over but um uh it remains to be seen how exactly russia are going to respond to this there was talk earlier that um they were going to upgrade the special military operation to some like anti-terrorism thing according to the duran um if you ask me russia you know from the russian side they should just take the gloves off now and say this is an all-out war. Quite why they don't do that, quite who Putin is trying to convince with all this legalism, I don't know. Um, but it, it, it strikes me that um, Putin has fought this entire war with one, one arm time behind his back. For the reason for that, I don't know, though. I don't know who this fictional lawyer he's trying to appeal to is. A lot of people have said the lawyer is Peter in himself. But, I mean, it's like, who believes in these legal fictions anymore? Uh, and certainly when the West, when America has uh, has done its military operations, it doesn't even bother trying with that legalism. So I don't know why, who Putin's trying to fool with this uh, special operations bullshit. But uh, at, th at this time, that legal fiction, it seems to me, is costing Russia, uh, you know, a position on the battlefield. So... You know, from the Prussian side of things, you'd want that to be rectified ASAP. Uh, otherwise, what Blair, Blair is saying here will come true. So anyway, let's carry on. Um, I don't think, you know, I, it's interesting this. Of course, as a result of the conflict, this is causing huge pressure in our own country. I mean, somebody, somebody in the chat saying it's called morality. What? Don't give me morality. Um, for a start, your enemies have openly and loudly said they think you're the next coming of Hitler for the past six or seven months. They have uh, put terrible economic sanctions on you. They've openly called for your overthrow. They've openly called for regime change. They have discriminated against Russians. They have called the Russians everything under the sun. So I just don't see what morality has to do with anything anymore uh, in this conflict. I also don't see what Putin's legalism is going to gain him in in the long run let's say he loses let's say he is a catastrophic loss you know there's only one way that ends for putin so i like i, I just don't see um who it's designed to appeal to like who like I, who is the fictional russian who cares about the legal status of this at the moment it's constraining the generals on the ground by uh, limiting the amount of troops they have available 
available to them and limiting their, their uh, you know, their targets. Um, so take just, I, I think that the Russians should, should take the gloves off at this point from their own point, from a strategic and military point of view. It, there's just no point to, to this legal fiction. Um, and, and also I don't see where morality is going to come into it. I mean, um, the West have painted the, themselves as the good guys. So, you know, you're never going to win the optics battle at this point. So just fucking go for it, I, I say. It, th there are signs that they've done that. They they hit some um, uh, power, um, you know, nuclear power stations, and um, they, they hit the grid. Uh, half of Ukraine went dark last night. Um, so they are expanding their range of targets, which is uh, why they think they may expand the the range uh, on this label, you know, upgrading it from the special military operation to um, the uh, at some, you know, at counterterrorism or whatever they call it. But I, I just don't know why he just doesn't declare war at this point. It really, like, who cares? I, I, I would go as far as to say that Vladimir Putin is the only man on earth who cares about this. Uh, the, the actual label. Everybody else in the entire world sees it as a war. So just call it a war. Like, what? I mean, unless there's some Russian expert in the chat who can tell me why he doesn't do that. Like, who, like, do the Chinese care about that? I can't see the Chinese caring about, like, what the Russians call, you know, their, their invasion of Ukraine. <laughs> I mean, what difference does it make? So anyway, let's uh, see what Blair has to say. I mean, in Britain, the cost of living crisis is, you know, there isn't another political issue. Um, I think it's the same virtually everywhere in Europe, but nowhere do I see, not in our country, for example, do, do people say, well, you know, we should just give Russia what they want in Ukraine in order to, to give ourselves some, some cost of living space. No, people are not saying that. So I think he's going to find it increasingly hard. I think the sanctions, the sanctions that are biting hardest are the ones people don't really see, which are the sanctions on the supply of components, the things the Russian economy needs. And, you know, there are, according to some estimates, you know, a couple of million people that have left Russia since the beginning of the conflict. And you, can, you know what those people will be. They'll, they'll be the younger, more connected people who will, who will just see no future uh, for themselves in the Russia that is today. And, you know, democracy, democracy has got a bit of a, well, it's been challenged, let's say, in recent years. But, you know, there are two decisions that I think are very interesting that are decisions that show you why democracy is in the end, for all its faults, the best way of, of governing. One is the decision to invade Ukraine, because in a democratic system that would never have happened. It's why no two democracies have ever been to war with each other. Um, I mean, <laughs> if you redefine every country who's not your friend as non-democratic, then you can say, well, that's why no two democracies. But technically speaking, Russia does have democracy. So, you know, it does, it does have elections. Putin is elected. Uh, whether, whether you like the results or not, he is elected. Um, it does have a parliament. So, uh, you know, uh, and, you know, if, if, while we're at the question, we can ask serious questions about the extent to which Ukraine is a functioning democracy. There's been a lot of shenanigans on the Ukrainian side when it comes to free and fair elections. So these are just word games by uh, the Dark Lord here. Um, and as we'll see as this interview progresses, he, least of anyone in the world, believes in democracy. I do not believe that Blair, deep down, is a Democrat. But let's, uh, let's carry on. People would have said, no, this is crazy. You shouldn't do this. Don't do it. Here are all the reasons. But if you, if you have a system that's dictatorial with no challenge, then people can do these things. And the other is, the, frankly, the COVID. Dictatorial with no challenge, like Ursula von der Leyen or <laughs> any of his other twat friends in the EU. I mean, what, whose leg is he pulling with all this rub rubbish? But uh, anyway. Policy of China. You know, both are decisions that would never have been taken had you had a system that challenged the leadership. Right. So, 
you know, this is, this is what has happened. I think, look, I, I hope it can be brought to an end peacefully, but in the meantime, we've got to give Ukraine every support. Much has been made yesterday about the war in Ukraine being a wake-up call for Europe and the West. And I know you've been quite critical. You've been saying many times that the West is at an inflection point, that Western democracy needs a new project. Western politics has turned uh, partisan, ugly, unproductive. This is what you said in your recent speeches. Are you hopeful that this war uh, is going to be the glue, is going to be the accelerator for Western Europe to come together and regain its sense of purpose? I mean, I'm naturally optimistic. Okay, so you, you can't be British Prime Minister with our media and, and not be naturally optimistic. Um, so I think, yes, but, but I think we should define what this inflection point is. I mean, I think there were two other inflection points in, in recent European history and Western history. One was in 1945, when after the Second World War, there was a project to, of creating NATO as a, as a bulwark against uh, the Communist Soviet Union. Um, that project, which was around foreign policy and defense, was matched then by a domestic policy. You know, most countries around the world, from the Western perspective, right, developed welfare states, healthcare systems, education systems. You know, in, in the UK, it wasn't just about the creation of NATO and the creation of, of defense and security relationships it was also a be careful friends while you're watching this those hands will mesmerize you so just be careful a, a domestic a, a a policy about our economy and our society as well and then in the 1980s i think again there was a, there was a a project that was around how we brought the soviet union to the point of collapse but also there was then a a project of liberalization, if you like, within European and Western economies. I think today it's very clear what our foreign policy objective is, because the significance of Ukraine is not just in respect of Russia, it's in respect of China also. Because the biggest geopolitical change of my children's lifetime is going to be China and what it means for 21st century politics. Now we can get onto that in a, in a minute, but that is what that should do, the combination of what's happened in Ukraine and the thought of the power of China for the future is the West should recover its cohesion strategically in terms of foreign policy and its confidence in its own value system. But we also need a domestic agenda as well, because I don't know how things look here, but I would say in most of the major Western countries right now, politics is often deeply divided. There's a huge crisis. You know, the cost of living crisis is going to go on for some time. You're going to have inflation, rising interest rates. You know, we've got a tough, tough situation ahead of us with politics becoming very partisan. So you also need a domestic policy. There, there it is. The the George Bush uh, fist point. Agenda, what is our project for domestic policy? And my view on it, this is something we can debate, is the single biggest real world event that's happening is the technology revolution. It's going to change everything. It is changing everything. But the problem that you've got today is that the people in government making policy, they're in one room and the change makers are in another room. And you've got to make the policy makers and the change makers come together. Because this technology revolution, in my view, is the only way you're going to recover growth, productivity, higher living standards, and you're gonna deal with climate change. There isn't another way of doing it. Now, I may be wrong on that, but it's a debate we should have. My point is, the inflection point is, has got to be more than just about defense and security. I think that is obvious. I think what's less obvious is if you were back in politics today governing a country, what would you be trying to do in terms of domestic policy? Because otherwise you're facing a situation where your society is going to become more divided between the wealthier people and the poorer people, and growth and productivity are going to be down where they need to be up. 
And that's quite a challenge, isn't it? If we're looking at the landscape, even looking at Italy these days, where uh, Miss uh, Georgia. But you see, it, it, it's quite clear from what the way Blair was talking there is that um, he doesn't actually think there should be <laughs> disagreements on where I think he, he wants there to be consensus across foreign policy and across domestic politics. He wants there to be a kind of continuity across the West when it comes to these matters. Um, and as we'll, as we'll see, this is an ongoing um, theme, I guess, in uh, Blair's thinking. He doesn't like the disagreement, doesn't like the, the back and forth of actual politics. He wants there to be broad consensus on these things. Uh, the only question is, how do we harness technology to get to where we're to where we want? You know, um, note he mentioned climate change as a as a big thing that people need to come together on, um, and that's a particularly difficult sell at a time of an energy crisis. So let's see let's see where where he goes with this. Meloni uh, might take over soon. We're seeing politicians uh, also fueled by social media who are offering easy solutions to very complex uh, problems, uh, getting increasingly more complex. That certainly wasn't different when you were in charge, but social media didn't play that, that big of a role back then, did it? Um, at the end of the day, if you're looking at, at the landscape, political landscape right now as to compared to when you were in charge, what is the biggest difference? Well, social media for sure. Mm. Look, when I was in office, I, I didn't even have a mobile phone. Was Which that good I, or bad? It was good. <laughs> <laughs> it was good. Hello. It led to, I got my first mobile phone the day after I left office. And I, I remember. I bet he did. Hello, it's Bill. Would you like some money? <laughs> so it's fantastic, right? So I sent my first text. To, 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 to somebody, and I didn't realize that it didn't necessarily show up who I was on the, for the person receiving it. So I got a message back that said, sorry, but who are you? <laughs> and I was thinking, it's been 24 hours. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> so, you know, I, I, it's, for, for, social media is a revolutionary phenomenon because it's About the first lesson you learn in leadership in politics is that those that shout loudest don't deserve to be heard most. Right. Totally based point from Blair. That, that is a Machiavelli 101. Those who shout the loudest don't deserve to be heard the most. And he was a master at saying no to those people when he was in power. But social media is, is a platform for the loudmouth. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, you, I, I, I sometimes read this stuff and I think, first of all, who is it that's got the time to sit there and do all this, right? But secondly, it's just the, the casual abuse, the, ex, the, ex, the exchange of, of usually ill-informed opinions masquerading as political debate. And so it's very difficult. But I think there is an irony, a paradox in social media it creates waves of opinion that put real pressure on politicians, right? On the other hand, the curious thing is, at the same time, the public respects leadership. So for me, I'm always looking for the politicians that say, I don't care what's on social media. Here's what I think, and this is what I'm going to do. So based. So based. Because I respect that, right? And I think probably a lot of the public does as well. But for the politicians, it's very hard. You know, you get some avalanche going on in social media. And I will say to political leaders, OK, you, but you've got to decide whether this represents 10,000 people, 100,000 people, 1 million people, or maybe just one person. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, that's a big change. But the other big change is this. I mean, this is just sense. This is super sensible, pragmatic stuff that I think um, leaders today get wrong all the time, especially with the woke mobs, especially with the woke mobs. Um, you know, maybe Blair has other mobs in mind, but I mean, the, bloke, the, 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 the woke mobs, so often it's just like literally just one person. And you see companies come out and make a big deal of responding to that. Um, I mean, obviously we know that they want to, but, but still, 
uh, I think he's making a fundamentally good point when it comes to this. Yes. And this comes back to this point about a modern agenda. You see, we live in an era where people need radical change. I mean, take your healthcare system, right? In most countries, it's underperforming, right? Your education system is underperforming. You've got a category of people that aren't participating in the wealth of society. If you don't have a rational answer to that problem, then the populace comes along and says, no, it's easy. The right say it's the immigrants. The, the left says, no, it's the big business. Right? And that populism then destroys what I call a strong center. And the truth of the matter is, today's world is about understanding this change that's going on and looking at how you harness it. So healthcare today is going to be all about how you move to a different system of diagnostics, how people look after their own healthcare in a much greater way, how you empower patients, how you reorganize your healthcare system, difference between the tertiary, secondary, primary care. It's all about that. It's all about how you deliver new treatments. You know, you look at COVID. That was a very fancy way of, <laughs> that was a very fancy way of telling people to lower their expectations of what their health system gives them. Uh, if you really listen to what he was saying there. <laughs> um, but uh, I do respect his basic elitism though. Uh, I'm not saying that his ultimate answer is right because he far too readily dismissed, for example, the concerns about immigration in that little spiel there. But um, he, he, I mean, he doesn't respect the wisdom of the crowd. Um, that kind of Burkean point, it's very clear from what he's saying here that he doesn't believe that the people can generate an answer. Um, and he very much has the faith in the, in, in the expert class, which uh, is what we should really expect of a uh, you know, managerial dark lord here. Um, but I also think that we too should be kind of skeptical of what is called populism, left or right, um, which is not to say that the that the people are always wrong, but it but it is to say that uh, they, they they may need to be stewarded uh, with wise and sensible leadership. Um, it's just that uh, maybe the uh, the answers that we would want to generate are not quite the same as Blair's. And the development of mRNA vaccines, right? That is a medical revolution. It's also, by the way, going to spin out a whole lot of other. <laughs> but by the way, do you remember he talked about my democracy earlier on? I mean, what happened to that? <laughs> but anyway, let's carry on. Advances in medical science. But how you deliver this and how you make it impact the organization of your healthcare system, that is the issue. But how many people are really debating that issue in the way that it needs? Likewise with education. You know, we have how you teach young people today and the skills they need, it's just completely different. I mean, I think in education today, you'll basically have two sets of skills that would be really important. It was explained to me the other day by someone who works in the school system in the UK. He said, basically, you're gonna have hard tech skills and then you're gonna have hard human skills, right? And it's gonna be a combination of understanding because your teacher's not gonna give you all the information anymore. You know, when I think of the education I had, I mean, okay, I, I can probably still recite the kings and queens of, of of England going back seven centuries, but frankly, I've never found that a huge amount of use. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So today, what do employees look for? They look for people familiar. Uh, note the Blair's view of education is entirely utilitarian. <laughs> like, what does the system need? That is what education should deliver. Uh, he sees no actual value in education for its own sake, uh, which is uh, an interesting insight into the man, I would say. With, with technology, because that's what's happening in their businesses. But they also look for young people with creative skills, right? Who can solve problems collaboratively, who, who've got some ability to think of things differently, right? Those are skills that we're, we're in danger of underestimating completely within the education system. So my point is this, if you want to take on this populism, you can't just say to people, look, you've got the crazy left and the crazy right, and we just should be sensible. 
You need a bigger project than that. That's why I come back to this thing. You need to decide what 21st century politics looks like. Is this Blair arguing for a positive vision? I think it is, isn't it? He's saying uh, there needs to be a positive vision in the centre. <laughs> and that is, I think that's the toughest task because on the foreign policy side, I think it's pretty obvious where we are. But I find the domestic side much more challenging. And it's quite challenging indeed. You've mentioned many of those challenges, health care, uh, cost of living, rising inflation, the pandemic, to go on and on, energy, food security. And people are looking for leadership. People are looking for political leadership all uh, over uh, the world. And uh, as somebody who was in charge for 10 years uh, of, of, of a large country, the, the one person alone cannot fix all these problems, uh, can they? At the end of the day, people look for political leadership but is the political class, I guess, is what I'm asking, up to these enormous challenges? Or is, it, what is, is this unfair for us as the populists to ask for one or two persons to actually fix all these problems at the same time when they all have uh, global ramifications and links, of course? Well, politics is a strange business, you know. I mean, it's, I, mean I always think the journey of being a leader is that you... You start in government at your most popular and least capable, and then you end <laughs> at your least popular and most capable. And you kind of, by the time you come to the end, you kind of want to say to people, look, I've, I've worked out how to do this stuff now. You don't want to get rid of me. I know how to do it. <laughs> <coughs> Spoken from the heart. Spoken absolutely from the heart. He, uh... He didn't want to leave power behind because now I'm now I'm a level twenty wizard. Damn it! I need to. I, now I have the power. Let me lead. <laughs> I am the Senate. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, very interesting little insight into uh, Blair's thinking here. But you know, politics is. I mean, you imagine if you were running a football club, and you know, I don't know, Man City, Man United. And, um... Big change. Right, in my case, Newcastle. But anyway, but imagine if you, you said, right, we've got, to, we've got to hire a new coach. But I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're just going to go out, and what, whoever is the most enthusiastic fan, we're going to put them in charge. People would say, you, you, you're mad. You've got to have someone with qualifications who's done a whole lot of work and has worked their way up and knows the system. Blair is literally critiquing democracy here. He is literally critiquing the idiotic selection process of democracy. <laughs> I mean, about half an hour ago, he was talking about why democracy is the best system. Here, he's literally saying it selects for idiotic things. You know, I was an idiot when I was first prime minister. Now I have all the skills necessary. Let me lead, damn it. This is, but whether he knows it or not, even despite himself, he is arguing for kind of technocratic dictatorship of people like himself um you know who don't have to care about you know, the uh, the slings and arrows of uh, of the media in politics no i mean the first job i had was prime minister <laughs> uh, you know if you're going to start start at the top it's a good thing to do but how did that work out well it was it was tough at the you know i i i, I said to my people after about 18 months i said look the first job I had was prime minister, and then I worked my way up slowly to be, uh, you know, president of the whole damn world. But uh, I mean, he he clearly resents the fact that this happens. He clearly feels that he's in a better position now to govern than when he was the young Tony Blair in 1997. And even though he's making a joke about it, I, there is a serious political point being made here about the fecklessness and kind of cluelessness of our leaders um you know uh maybe we should allow people of the experience of blair to govern i mean does anyone have a better idea i'm not saying it should be blair but it does seem strange it does seem strange that you know uh we you know i mean david cameron's first job was prime minister as well i mean it's just stupid <laughs> why uh why, why would you ever have that as a selection system? Damn good point being made by a dark lord here. Well, I've, got to, I've got to level with the British people. I've got to go out there and say, you know, you've just got to understand I'm, I'm, I'm still learning. I'm learning on the job here. 
And they said, no, you can't. The people will panic <laughs> because everyone expects you to come in fully formed and you're not. So what is necessary for, for political leaders is, is, I think, three things. First of all, you've got to have a plan, you know, because one of the weaknesses of Western policymaking at the moment is the absence of long-term thinking and strategy. And one of the... I mean, this is literally ABC of why democracy sucks from, from Blair. He is literally teaching the Blair Strategic Forum, um, you know, just, just standard critiques of democracy. <laughs> uh, short planning horizon, number one. I mean, this could be Hans Hermann Hopper talking here. Um, or, or Curtis Yarvin or someone like that. Um, yes, short planning horizon. We need a long-term strategic plan. Correct. That's good. I mean, that is one of the advantages that the Chinese and the Russians have had. A damn good point by Tony, yet again. The things you really learn as a, uh, as a leader is the difference between the day-to-day -day and the crises and the events you have to deal with and long-term strategy, right? What I used to call the big picture. So you need that. Secondly, you need other people around you. But it's easier to draw those other people around you if you've all got a common project, right? And you find then people of ability gravitate towards you. But the third thing... So you need elites. You need, you need genuine elites to help you with the project. But make it a long-term project. So it's not the usual clowns who get involved in politics. Yeah, very good. The thing you need is, you need time. I mean, in the work my institute does, and we help, we basically help governments make change. We have teams of people go and live and work in a country and work with the government of a country. I, I swear, I swear, if Blair read The Populist Illusion, there wouldn't be a, a, a page in that book that he would disagree with. In fact, I might send the populist illusion. Mike, if you're watching from Imperium, please send a copy of the populist illusion to the Tony Blair Institute or, or anybody. Just, just, just flood Blair with copies of the populist illusion. I think he'd read it and I think he'd agree with every damn thing I say in that book. ...to help them make change. I reckon you need 15 to 20 years of consistent policy to bring about change. Now, that doesn't mean to say you have the same leader for 15 to 20 years, but the same project. Hey, listen to what he just said. <laughs> you need to have a 20 year project that doesn't change no matter who's in power. Now I'm not saying we have the same leader, but you should have the same project, which basically, which basically renders the, the whole idea of liberal democracy and people voting for their leaders completely moot, doesn't it, Tony? I mean, if the project doesn't change, it doesn't actually matter who's in charge, does it, Tony? So, <laughs> so this is his, this is basically Blair, literally and barefacedly arguing for his own dictatorship <laughs> of Great Britain. I just, it's just wild. I, I can't believe he's saying it in public. <laughs> yeah, you just need to have a 20, 30 year project. Nothing, you know, where, where it doesn't, you can change the personnel all you want but the project stays the same and everybody's on board with the central project. So not democracy then, yes, Tony? I mean, this is basically what he's arguing. He just, he's just, I mean, he, he doesn't need to read the populist illusion. He knows it already. And part of the trouble is, you know, at the moment our politics is kind of lurching from one side to another. And, you know, you only have to look at the US. I mean, if you are an external partner of the United States at the moment, you know, you look back over the last 20 years, you're finding consistency of policy quite hard to divine from the external point of view. So I think this is all what it were, this is all difficult, but... See, you see, this is an excellent point as well, because just, just pretend you're a foreign country trying to make sense of what the hell America has been doing since, I mean, it was the, it was the, uh, the anniversary of 9-11 yesterday um so what was it 20 20 21 years since 9 11 um and uh, and of course if tony blair had his way they would never have pulled out of iraq they would never have pulled out of afghanistan they would have stayed the course 
And the trouble is, is that administrations come and administrations go and they don't see anything through. Um, I, I remember thinking this when I read Henry Kissinger's book, uh, World Order. And he was talking about um, the Korean War and he was talking about uh, Vietnam and he was talking about various other um, kind of escapades the, the USA has had uh, in its history. And there are moments where you can even see Kissinger is like, yeah, it was bad, basically, because a different president came in. He brought he brought, uh, you know, new ideas with him. Uh, the populace was unhappy. And basically, we, 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 we buggered it up time and time again. Um, so, I mean, regardless of whether you agree with all of these foreign policy decisions, he is basically right that you, you have to see things through. I mean, I, might, I mean, look at the actions of the German government from the outside. Well, what the hell are they doing? What the hell are they doing? Oh, they, they sign up to a massive pipeline and then they cancel it and then they sanction. I mean, it's just you have to have a consistent policy um, that, you know, doesn't change on a whim. Um, so all of these points that Blair is making are technically correct, regardless of whether you agree with his vision or not. And obviously, I don't agree with his vision. He is making fundamentally correct points. The one thing I, I you know, this is definitely true of leadership in any situation, whether you're leading a country, a, you know, a corporation or a football club indeed, you know, you need to give people a clear sense of direction. And that's why I come back to this question of strategy. What is our foreign policy objective in the West? And what is our domestic policy objective? Because for the first time in modern history, there is going to be the Blair steeple. Did you see it? Did you see the steeple? Let's watch it again. Foreign policy objective in the West, and what is our domestic policy objective? Because for the, the steeple, first time the steeple. in modern history, there is going to be a challenge to Western dominance from the East that is, at one level, a legitimate challenge because China and, of course, India. By dint of population, size of economy, technology, civilization, culture, these are going to be major powers in the world. But the challenge is, particularly in respect of China, they've got a different ideology to ours. And so we're going to face a big challenge, and that's why the unity of the West and the recovery of strength in the West is so important. Of course, I cannot uh, pass up the opportunity to speak to you about UK-EU relationships post-Brexit. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was, at, I was on stage at the Bled Strategic Forum with EU Chief Negotiator Michel Barnier four years ago. Uh, uh, but by the way, a lot of that spiel was him basically saying, listen, China don't play by these stupid rules. They've got long-term planning. They stick to their, they stick, they stick their long-term domestic and foreign objectives. So... Basically, if we're going to fight them, we need to get serious. That's basically what you're saying um, there uh, in so many words, um, as well as, you know, around the back door arguing for his own permanent dictatorship of, <laughs> of, of Europe and the West, um, or if not himself, people who think exactly like him in all ways. Uh, I mean, it's, it's been an exceptionally... Um, elitist presentation, even by Blair standards, even by Blair standards, this has been a remarkably mask off interview, I, th I think. Uh, where he prematurely announced that a Brexit deal was imminent. Uh, of course, we know it came a bit different. It took a, a, a little while longer. Of course, it's one of the most prominent outspoken critics and opponents of Brexit now in 2022. Um, how do you assess the situation? First of all, how did Brexit work out for those who were advocating for it. Do you see some buyer's remorse? Right, well, I think I've got another appointment now, so... <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, let me try and... Let me try and choose my words carefully. Um, You're not running for office. That was an exceptionally funny joke by Blair as well. Well-timed humour. So... <laughs> no, but, you know, old habits die hard. <laughs> um, look, I was deeply opposed to Brexit, as you rightly say. I mean, right now, the, the challenge is to 
try and fix the problems, um, both economically and politically. There's no appetite in the UK for returning to the essential Brexit debate. Um, so we're going to have to, you know, we're going to have to make, make the best of the situation we're in. Now, I think that um, the steeple hands once again, as Blair has to deal with the inconvenient results that democracy keeps on throwing up, <laughs> which he doesn't want. <laughs> Um, you know, the, the, in his view, idiocy of Brexit ruining his 20 and 30 year plans that he set up 20 or 30 years ago. So there is a way we can reassess and the refashion a relationship with Europe outside of the European Union, where we're looking at the areas of cooperation, defense and security, energy, maybe technology, maybe there are other areas of cooperation we're going to have to fix the trading relationship you know outside of the single market and customs union but we're going to have to work out how we deal with the problems and of course the north in other words we need to move to make brexit basically irrelevant in all ways by realigning britain with europe in all ways that's basically what you said northern ireland protocol we're going to have to fix that and I hope that when the new prime minister is appointed, um, she or he uh, will fix that. Uh, but, you know, as I always say to people in the UK, we, we can change our political relationship with Europe. We can change our legal relationship with Europe. But we can't change our geography. You know, we're part of the continent of Europe. We will always be a European nation. Right. And you know, I think particularly for the younger generation in the UK, they, they want to see us with a, a revitalized relationship with Europe, even if we're outside, but to be working together and to be thinking of ourselves as allies and partners, because we are. And it's particularly important. I mean, Ukraine brings this home to us. You know, okay. So, so, so let's just move past Brexit as a kind of blip and just carry on doing all the things we were doing before. Isn't that right, Tone? That's basically what he wants. Whatever the disagreements between Britain and, and people inside the European Union on this one, we're together. And it's important we're together. When we talk about fashioning a strategy towards China for the future, we should be together. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, that's what I hope. <laughs> yeah. But it's, you know, it's, it's difficult because this, you know, the tragedy for British politics, but it, I think you can see this echoed and or replicated in much of politics around the Western world, you know, and I'm going to put it in very brutal terms here, how did we in Britain ever come to the point where the two of the most influential people in British politics were Nigel Farage and Jeremy Corbyn? I mean, how did we ever come to that point? I mean, he's just so fucking disgusted. He is just disgusted that people have a different view than him <laughs> that people have different political views to tony blair how dare people agree with jeremy corbyn and therefore make him labor uh, labor leader or how dare somebody like nigel farage with his little england uh, anti-immigration views come along and have an influence in the say so of our country isn't that right tony it's just absolutely disgusting uh, according to tony blair um, he, he is seething that somebody influenced British politics who wasn't a cipher of him. And if you notice, what's happened is that he and his minions and his agents in the UK have worked tirelessly to destroy Corbyn, to destroy Corbynism, to recapture uh, the Labour Party from um, the, the Corbynistas, and they have worked tirelessly to make sure that every single option on the Tory side is a cipher of Blair. Whether it was Sunak or Liz Truss or uh, Penny Morden, they were all Blair agents of one sort or another. So he has, uh, what, what do they call it? Total spectrum dominance. So that they see through his 20, 30 year plans without the small details of politics getting in the way 
I mean, from a certain point of view, I respect the sheer, I mean, I hesitate to say base because his vision is evil, but I do respect the will of somebody who's just, who, who sees themselves with such a kind of almost like divine right to, to govern, who knows the direction that things should go in, that these other ways of doing things, whether it's Corbyn or Farage, are just like, they're, they're just an inconvenience to him. And and he's just, um, uh, he, he can barely hide his disdain um, for what people might call the genuine right and the genuine left. He just sees them as, as, as almost like anachronisms belonging to another century or something. Uh, let, let, let's see where he goes. I mean, if you'd said to me when I was prime minister, oh, those are the two guys who are going to decide the future, I would have suggested you went for therapy. Uh, <laughs> And now it's us who's having to go for therapy because they did. <laughs> and, you know, the damage that was done to the Labour Party, for example, by this, which is now fortunately recovering under the, the new leadership. And then... <laughs> it's now fortunately recovering after I installed my man, Sir Keir Starmer, to steady the ship. <laughs> and the, the Conservative Party becoming what it, it really was... You know, the Conservative Party was always the sensible party, supposedly. You know, that was their thing. And then they got a dose of nationalism. And the trouble with this nationalism is that it's the easiest tune in the world to play, but it's the most superficial. Um, because in the world of which it's developing, it's, you're not representing your country's interest by coming, becoming part of this narrow nationalism. You say you are, but it's a false sort of patriotism. Because in the end, your national interest lies in cooperating with others. Because look, you take climate change, there's no way you can deal with that unless you're working together with other people. So this is, look, it's a, I think. Oh, he's such a fucking bastard. <laughs> such a slippery way of framing it, you know. If you're a nationalist, you're not really serving the interests of your country because it's in, your, in the interests of your country to cooperate globally on the issue of climate change <laughs> you know you're not really helping your country because in the real world globalism is the i mean he it, this is almost the network speech from um uh, you know uh, you have meddled with the prime forces mr beale this is basically blair's version of that of that speech basically saying like there are no nations basically there are no peoples there's only one <laughs> one system, and it's fucking mine. Global managerialism is the name of the game, says Blair. So stop it with your stupid, old-fashioned nationalism. You're not helping anyone, says, says Tony. We will resolve it in time. Um, but I, you know, I think right now, for the UK... I have to say, this is the most gloves off I've ever, like, I've done lots of these Blair breakdowns over the years. But when I saw this one, I was like, I have to, I have to cover this because he just doesn't hold back in this particular, this particular uh, interview. As I say, I don't think there's any desire to revisit the whole decision, mm. but I do think sensible people recognise you've got to have a decent relationship with your own continent. But clearly, judging by your words, you're quite concerned about... Sensible people agree with me. Isn't that right, Tony? <laughs> Sensible people recognise what I'm saying is true. That's always been the way he frames it. Um... Not just the future of the continent, but your country. Clearly, the words uh, that you spoke about, uh, the state of British politics, are very significant. You are, after all, the only Labour leader in the party's 100-year history to win three consecutive elections and <laughs> blow some more sm <laughs> this, this this turk has been so bloody obsequious throughout this as well you know <laughs> you know just remind him of all his all his achievements yeah yeah and as you pointed out there's a new leadership race right now in the uk after the tumultuous boris johnson years i don't want to put you in a delicate spot of having to comment on the leadership race but uh this trust richie sunak keith starmer well, look, for, so far as the Conservative Party is concerned, I, I don't know anything more that's in the papers. They... <laughs> that is a barefaced lie, an absolute barefaced lie. We know that Liz Trust called Tony Blair. That was in the papers. So, I mean, if you're reading the same papers as us, 
uh, Blair, we know that you've been consulted by Tories. So why are you why are you trying to say that you don't know anything? Barefaced lie. Say that Liz Truss is going to win. So the likelihood is that she's the prime minister. So they say, but I have no idea. She's going to make a good prime. <laughs> a complete lie. It's a complete lie. <laughs> she quoted him in his speech just shortly before becoming prime minister. I mean... Prime Minister? Well, I hope she, she makes a good Prime Minister because I want anyone who occupies that position to do well for Britain. Um, but, you know, Keir Starmer, I think, has made, that I do know about, has made big changes in the Labour Party. I think he's a very capable, sensible guy. So, at least... Do you think anyone in the room believes in what he says? Oh, I've got no idea about the Tory situation. I, you know, I'm just, uh, I'm just reading it in the paper like a disinterested citizen. It's just like, no, surely nobody believes this. Surely nobody believes that Tony Blair has had no contact with the Tory party at all. Um, it's a lie. We know it's a lie. But uh, anyway, it's interesting that he's saying he's been in closer contact with Starmer anyway. At least we're going to be competitive as the Labour Party today. And that, that's, that's a big uh, change and an important one. But I still think, you know, for the country as a whole, it's, you know, look, Britain has enormous strengths. It's, it's, it's got its, you know, big strengths in the financial sector and technology sector. Actually, Britain potentially is very strong in life sciences, for example. Um, you know, we, we've got a, a deep set of relationships uh, around the world. <laughs> We, we've got a culture and a language that's a great set of attributes for us, a very strong university sector. We've got lots of strengths and I'm... We've got a deep set of relationships. Many of them are mine. I know more African dictators than anybody in the entire world. <laughs> I mean, you want to see, you want to see my, di my, uh, my diary engagements, uh, friends. I have got contact all around the world. Why aren't we using them more effectively? <laughs> you know, at, at one level, I'm you know, always confident that Britain will see its way through. But I, I think we're just at this very, you know, as we described earlier, at this inflection moment where it really does require political leaders to have such a clear idea of what they stand for and what they want to achieve. Mm. You talked about the fringes dominating uh, European politics these days, global politics, really. You were, of course, synonymous uh, with the term and concept of a third way. Uh, do you think a new, I'm hearing that a new third way would be desirable, is needed? <laughs> the third position, you might say. The third position, the original third position is Tony Blair. And in that context, of course, I'm, I'm listening to you now and you're as energetic and, and passionate and enthusiastic about politics as I remember uh, back then. Political comeback with a new party, perhaps? <laughs> yeah. No, no, let's not get into that one. That would be, uh, that, that would be too give the, the Bled Forum a, um, um, a position in the UK media that would probably be <laughs> good for it and not so good for me. Um, but um... You see that? I mean, you know, let's not, let's not announce that at the Bled, at the Bled Forum because uh, otherwise the media might find out that we meet, that we meet at other places that aren't the WEF. <laughs> no, but I do think, you see, I think it's important to realise what, what myself, uh, at the time Bill Clinton and other people were trying to do I think we were trying to make sense of what I would say should have been the end of 20th century politics. Where 20th century politics was really a battle between the state and the market. Where the left used to think the more power you give the state, the more just the society. But by the way, this, what he's saying here, is 100% pure James Burnham managerial revolution talk. This public-private partnership idea that uh, was, you know, with the so-called third way is just the formal manifestation of managerialism as an ideology, as a, as a kind of system of governing. Um, that's all Blair is talking here. Uh, it, it, it's pure James Burnham. Uh, anyway, let's, let's listen to what he has to say. As you guys here in Slovenia know, I'm afraid that's not true. Right? Um, you know, the state can become its own vested interest and can be just as oppressive and brutal as any form of, of market domination. And then on the other side, the idea of the market being, you know, the invisible hand of the market being this, this hand of perfection. 
you know, delivering the outcomes everyone wanted. People understand that's wrong. So what you come to in the end is a question not about whether you should have a, a state with power, but how is that power used? And in particular, is... Note, by the way, do, do you remember if you, if you open the populist illusion, I start with four myths of liberalism. Uh, notice how many of those myths that Blair himself doesn't actually believe in. No, notice that Blair doesn't actually believe in the sovereignty of markets or, or the efficacy of markets. He just said it. What Blair believes in is a managerialism led by a small cadre of people who think like him. He doesn't, as we've seen in the stream, he doesn't believe in democracy and he doesn't believe in markets and he doesn't believe in, uh, he doesn't believe in pure socialism either. He just believes in, it, it, well, in this third way that we're learning about right now. Is it used to give power to itself or to empower people? And that's the purpose of having the state with an education system, a healthcare system, looking after law and order and so on, to make sure that the welfare of the people is better off. And in terms of the market, obviously, and particularly today with the fast change in the corporate sector, you need an enterprising private sector, right? Now, those two things are obvious today. And the parameters of where you, you put the intersection between state and market, I think you can debate that, but I don't think it's particularly interesting. It's much more interesting to me to say, well, how do you stimulate that enterprising private sector? And what is it that the state should do and how does it do it well? Those are the big... It's not interesting how the, the, the private uh, sector the markets, the corporations, and the state intersect. That's not interesting because he takes it for granted that those two things will be fused in a private-public partnership. He takes that for granted. What he's saying is, is that the interesting question is, how do you manage it? How do you direct, how do you direct those things in ways that he likes or him and his friends like? Um, and... In so many words, I basically agree with Blair, only obviously if we were in charge, we would direct it in a different way from the way that he would. Um, but all of the other parts of what he said are basically correct uh, as things stand in 2022. Um, and I'm not sure that you can actually, in the modern world as it stands today, disaggregate the uh, the public-private partnership Um I'm not sure that you can. Um, you can. You could probably use more state force to defang the power of corporations, but I don't think that Blair would necessarily disagree with that. Um, I, I was actually reading earlier on that um, he was saying he, he disagreed with Facebook and Twitter deplatforming Trump back in 2021, for example, because he doesn't think that that decision should be a corporate decision. Um, Blair believes that that decision should be made by people like him, not corporations. So it's it's kind of in, it's kind of interesting um, that in so many ways I agree with, like, other than his conclusions, I agree with much of what he's saying uh, because it's pure elite theory. It's pure elite theory. What Blair has taught has talked for this entire interview. Um, it's just that. You know, Blair is an enemy, not a friend. And what we need is friends in those positions directing directing uh, the public-private partnership. Questions. And so what we were trying to do with the, the third way is to say, get out of traditional socialism versus traditional capitalism debates, because it's really not how the next century... I mean, hundred, who disagrees with that? All, all, of the, all of the stuff, I mean, that we have been talking about how libertarianism doesn't really have any answer. It's not capitalism versus socialism anymore. It's just a kind of old fashioned uh, debate for 30, 40, 50 years ago. It no, it's no longer relevant and no longer describes how the world actually works. I mean, obviously Burnham was saying that back in the 1940s, but by this point in 2022, it's, a hun it's, it's, un it's undoubtedly correct. So, I, I would say that Blair is is, is basically right when uh, you know, on this on this particular score, his his third way, if you want to put it that way, is pretty much the only way now. Sure, is going to work, 
And I think that's still true. And the tragedy is that parts of Western politics have gone back with the left thinking what's radical is how much power does, is, does the state, does it go back to nationalization and the, you know, more power to the state? And the right thinking, you know, it's nationalism, anti-immigration. You know, if you, if you look at successful societies around the world today, a lot of them have been built on the success of the migrant population. I mean, to be... Now, 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 this is weak from Blair. This is like, this is like when, do you see, do you remember when Adam and Sitch, like, they geared up to fight the left and they've got great arguments and so on, but then they come to, like, you know, face someone like me or, or any right winger and they crumble, they have no arguments, they fall back on this bullshit. This is Blair here. I mean, surely, surely at this point in 2022, Blair doesn't believe that immigration, mass immigration has been an unbridled success. I mean, he can't believe this. I, I don't believe, like somebody as smart as him, surely is not falling back on these tired old arguments about, oh, you know, these nations were built on the back of immigration. Anti-immigrant is just, of course you need control and rules, but immigrants, in a country like Britain, have contributed an enormous amount. You look at Silicon Valley and tell me how many of the major firms there. These are, these are weak arguments, and he knows he's on weak ground here as well. But I, I think, you see, I think if Blair was to run again, he'd know that, and he'd, he'd, he would shift to a slightly more... Um, what he would do, as I've said so many times, he would argue for digital ID as a way of co combating immigration. That would be his way to get that in. But uh, anyway, let's carry on. Words started by people who, who were migrants. So I think the third way was an attempt to make sense of 20th century politics. But most of all, it was an attempt to put reason at the forefront, analyze the way the world is changing, and then see how you apply those values to a changing world. And the problem is, really try i think trying to go recapture the spirit of that is important going back to the policies we had in 1997 or you know whatever in america no of course it's a completely different world but the spirit of that looking for rational solutions trying to work out what the future looks like and how you prepare for it i think that's still well it's better than the two alternatives <laughs> Put it like that so we you see, it's, it's, it's a very progressive vision, though, isn't it? Because looking for what the future is going to be like and preparing things for it, that, I mean, that's basically saying that we're going to be in, a, in constant change, which is basically how, what Blair used to say in the 90s and the, in, in the 2000s. He's basically embracing the fact that things are going to keep on changing. And in fact, if you really follow Blair's thinking, he accelerates those changes. But what if we don't want things to go in that way, Tony? I mean, he has this kind of telos, this logic of inevitability. The future is going to look like this, and we have to prepare for that. But what if the future doesn't look like that? What if we've got a different vision of what the future might look like? What if our vision for the future is, I don't know, um, not a globalist one, for example, or uh, what if we want to prioritize a world that puts things other than base materialism first? Um, these kind of first order questions, I think, are beyond, they're almost beyond Blair's um, thinking in a way. I mean, I, I do think that he is trapped in a, in a late 90s, early 2000s materialist mindset. Um, so he, he just cannot, he can't think outside of that li uh, liberal bubble in a way, um, despite the fact that he sees through all the other aspects of liberal democracy. Unfortunately, his basic telos is a progressive one. And um, the only way that me and Blair would differ, uh, I, you know, in, in, when it comes, like, like I said, I think that Blair would agree with most of the populist illusion if he read it. But I think where me, where he and I would differ is that his view is fundamentally progressive, socially progressive, uh, technologically progressive, etc. Um, whereas, uh, you know, as, as we've talked about so many times, I'm a 
postmodern traditionalists. I would, I, I, I just don't, I don't think that the future is inevitably the way, you know, the one that Tony Blair uh, envisions. And it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be that. Uh, but I, I think a lot of progressives do have this. I think that uh, if you speak to, I speak to people on Twitter all the time. Uh, a friend, you know, people who I've been friends with for a long time, like um, Oosh, for example, or M Mrs. Oosh. Um, uh, many other type, types types of people as well, who who basically do have this idea that technological change, a uh, capital P progress driven by technology, um, and the world's going to change in that way, whether we like it or not. So we might as well be on the cutting cutting edge of it. Um, and I, I I really want people to try to break out of that way of thinking. It's it's very much part of boomer truth. It's very much part of boomer truth and. Um, it's going to it's going to take quite a lot to break that. That's what I want to do in my next book, The Prophets of Doom, is to break the myth of progress. Because um, uh, once that's gone, everything's on the table. I would say once that kind of view of capital P progress uh, has gone. Um, so uh, anyway, let's uh, let's see where Blair goes. Clearly not making any uh, headlines here, BSF headlines about a political comeback. But 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 one thing is for sure. One thing is for sure. I mean, you're still, you're still, uh, and we're slowly. I'm being mindful of the time that uh, that uh, we're coming to the end. You're still shaping policy through your Institute for Global Change. And uh, I was wondering, after 10 years of being British Prime Minister and now 15 years of experience working with governments around the world, what is the most important lesson that you have learned and that you could pass on? to future generations. Many of them are here in the audience today. Well, not from a Jedi. <laughs> well, I mean, I've learned a lot of humility over that time. Uh, and I'm still astounded by the amount that I don't know. But I've learned a lot since leaving office. In fact, sometimes I'm shocked by how much I've learned since leaving office, and think it would have been useful to have known all that when I was there. <laughs> but the two things I've learned are these. One is that the quality of governance is the determining factor of success in today's world. Because everything else is mobile. Capital's mobile, technology's mobile. What isn't mobile is your government. And if you look at the European Union, one of the reasons why I'm so passionately in favor of the European Union when you look at governments that have made big changes in their country, you know, you can point to individual examples. You might point to Singapore or you might point to Israel, you might point to in Africa, Rwanda. But if you, if you look at the biggest changes that have happened. I mean, the Rwandan government has made a lot of big changes in its uh, recent history. I don't know what, he's, what specifically he's referring to there. But in governments, a lot of it has been those countries for enlargement, you know, that come into the European Union and change their countries dramatically. Europe has had a huge dramatic impact on the progress of countries. Now, why is that? Because the European Union provided certain standards and governments had to change to adapt to that. So reform, you, you can take two countries around the world today who are... You see, this is such a perverse view of government. Blair sees the role of government, from what he just said, as transforming nations to bring it into line with global technological change. This is an insane view of what a government is. I mean, I thought he might go in a different direction there and talk about how, you know, everything else is mobile, but the government is the one thing that is stable. But he's actually talking about a government as an agent of change. See, when I say Blair would agree with the populist illusion, he would read the Paul Gottfried chapter about managerialism as a as a kind of transformational force, you know, the, the therapeutic state, and he just nod in agreement that he was like, yes, that's what government should be doing. Um, and I, I'm, I'm like, what about the role of a government protecting its institutions and its culture and its history and protecting them? from the the kind of volatility uh, and the violence of constant 
mobile capital, mobile technology, you know, um, mobile labor, and all of these other things, which in my view are the antithesis of what a nation is or what a people are. You can't just have everything constantly changing all the time. Some things have to be held constant. This is a fundamental philosophical disagreement between me and Tony Blair. Tony Blair, he's like, oh, no, all of this change is inevitable, and it's the role of the government to get the people and the country and its institutions to basically transform all of those to get them ready for this you know, magic future that's always coming. This, this, this is an insane view and, and cannot serve as a model for government, I'm afraid. So for all of the other correct things Blair has said, on this, I cannot agree. And this is something that if we in Britain are ever going to get anywhere politically, we have to enact the revolution of the mind. We have to, like, somehow... I don't know if Sargon is still watching this stream, but, like, it, it, you know, if the, rev if, the, if the revolution is impossible, and I, d I do believe, by the way, that the revolution is impossible in the UK. It may happen in America, it may happen in France, it may happen in Italy. It's not happening here. The Tory party are too powerful, they're too good at what they do, and this fucker is too good at what he does. So what we need to do somehow is to create a revolution in the minds of people like Liz Truss or Mog or whoever else to stop thinking in this fucking insane way that Blair is Blair is talking here. R rather than see government as an instrument of perpetual change and reform, how about seeing government as something that actually helps protect the the heritage of your country? Just in a little way. I mean, we've seen in the past couple of days, uh, you know, with the sad passing of the Queen and, um, you know, the proclamation of King Charles and we're, we're still in this period of mourning, we have seen, and Blair himself has been on TV talking about the strength of tradition when, when you hold certain things in the nation constant. And we've seen the power of that in the, in the monarchy and in the traditions around the monarchy. You know, for all of their other faults, and there are many with, uh, with the Queen that we've talked about in the past, now is not the time to talk about them. We've seen the strength of holding certain things constant. And all I'm talking about is a government that holds more of those things constant, not this model of perpetual revolution that Blair is talking about here. Because we can't live like this, basically. And and this, if Tony, I mean, in some bizarre, bizarre world, maybe Blair himself will watch this stream. I doubt it. Maybe one of his minions will watch it. I doubt it. But if you are listening from the Tony Blair Institute, just this one fundamental disagreement that we have, how about updating your formula of constant change to reflect the fact that people cannot handle the speed of the changes that you're trying to put on them? They just can't handle it. And so, of course, you're going to get this politicization and coming apart because you're holding nothing constant in their lives. And it's those constant things that people call a society. It's those things that are constant that make a civilization. If you're constantly changing the people and the businesses and the capital and the institutions and everything else around them, people don't know if they're coming or going. What did Carlisle call it? Nomadism. And, and, and I'm afraid this is why ultimately people are rejecting your vision, Tony Blair. That's why the populations of America and Europe are rejecting Clinton, Blair, third wayism in a nutshell. It's deeper than all these, you know, woke or not woke or anything. It, it's that, what I just said. And I, I, I just wish that somebody in the ruling class and in the elites would, would recognize that fact, as clearly King Charles at some level does. Uh, having heard uh, some clips uh, surface of him talking about the traditionalists and René Guénon recently. So, so you know, hopefully there's more than just him. Um, anyway, let's uh, finish this. Side by side, same resources, same potential. One succeeds, one fails. You know, 
I've just given you one, Rwanda, we compare them next door, Burundi. Or you could look at Poland, part of the European Union, and before the conflict, but look at Ukraine. Look at where they were in 1992, roughly equivalent. Look at where they were in 2021, right? Or you could look at Colombia and Venezuela, right? Or the biggest experiment in governance that the world has ever known, which is the Korean Peninsula, North and South Korea. In the 1960s, South Korea had a GDP per head the same as Sierra Leone, right? And look at it today. Now, how's that come about? Through change, through reform, through the rule of law, uh, through democratic accountability, right? So that's one big lesson I've learned, the absolute central importance of governance, and it's why all the things we've been talking about are so important. But the second thing is about the technology revolution. Now, you know, it, it's, it's hard. It's hard for an, someone from an older generation to understand this. I was um, saying when I had dinner with the, uh, the president here last night, and... I was talking to him about technology and I described to him how, how just recently I was asked to go and address a conference on cryptocurrency and its implications for the geopolitics. So I'm about two hours from going on to the conference and I'm, 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 try, I'm struggling. I'm struggling with some of the cryptocurrency and what it means and so on. So I phone up my, my son who's... Um, got a technology company is big in the technology sector and I say to him look I'm about to go on the stage in two hours time talking about cryptocurrency I said what what do I say <laughs> he said dad tell him you're sick <laughs> he, tell him tell him you're <laughs> but you see it's funny because Blair himself has admitted several times on this stream that even he can't keep up with the rate of change even he can't keep up with it. So why does he want to bring it about so much? I mean, I just don't like, just slow it down some. Anyway. <laughs> tell him you just, he said, tell him you just failed your COVID test. He said, tell him anything, but you're not fit to go on that stage. I'm just telling you right now, right? So it's difficult for someone from a, an old generation, but I'm just looking at the world objectively and saying it's all about that and increasingly what it'll be is how the first bit connects with the second bit so that's that's what i'm learning and if there's any advantage in being outside of government rather than inside is that occasionally you can see i mean i, I do think the, the there's a watching this stream there's a slight there's a slight kind of boomer in blair that is just in awe of technology he's just in awe of it it's like a kind of magic to him um, and I, I do think that this is behind his kind of messianic vision. Uh, I've heard John, I've heard Boris, Boris Johnson, the uh, now former prime minister, he, he talks about technology in this way as well. And uh, it really does kind of, I mean, it, it is part of the the reign of quantity, uh, to, to, to quote Gwynon again, which uh, King Charles was talking about. Um, the reign of quantity is all about this kind of worship of technology for its own sake and the, almost in awe of it you know, to hell with the consequences of what those technologies bring. I mean, even even Blair I earlier in this stream was talking about w how social media has been a bad thing, basically. It's been a bad thing. It's been a, a counterproductive political force uh, from his point of view. Um, you know, he can't get his head around crypto. So why does he worship these things so unquestioningly? All, all it takes is a kind of might, like a, sh a small shift in mindset. And even Blair himself could be, you know, the wise governor that he envisages himself as. But, but, but the, the, this part of his thinking is just pure Faustian madness, I'm afraid. Be the big picture clearer than those people dealing with the day to day. You were prime minister for 10 years. You won three consecutive elections. Do you miss power? This is, this is such a good question. Do you miss power? Do you miss being in power? Well, do you want the honest answer or the not honest answer? <laughs> Absolutely. The, the, the honest. not honest answer is no, I'm really enjoying life. It's <laughs> great. <you know. laughs> Some do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, it was a treat. It was a treat. Uh,
just just about to shoot lightning through his fingers at the end of asking such an important question. But I mean, the Dark Lord basically admits that he that he wants all the power, unlimited power. He wants the power, which makes uh, obviously it makes him a very dangerous man. But uh, there's a, there's somebody who wore the One Ring and just cannot. Like he he's basically Gollum, <laughs> you know, searching the world to get more and more power because he's had a taste of it and can never let it go. And speaking of the populist delusion, in 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 um in um Robert Michels, who's famous for the concept of the iron law of oligarchy, um, in his book Political Parties, he talks about how intoxicating power is, and that once people have had a taste of it, they can never let go of it again. I mean, they had to drag Thatcher kicking and screaming. She cried for days, apparently, after she was removed from power and never got over it for the rest of her life. Clearly, Blair, uh, obviously much younger when when he you know stepped out of Downing Street, has spent the rest of his life consolidating whatever power he can get his hands on. I mean, I believe he actually wields as much, if not more, power now as he did when he was in Downing Street. But his answer is so revealing. He wants back there. He's just intoxicated by it. Um, and uh, I, in a way, you have to respect his honesty for giving that answer, so. Listening to you, Tony, Prime Minister Sir Tony, so listening to you, uh, getting a broad perspective of 21st century politics, what needs to be done with the wisdom of somebody who's been there and now has the luxury or the burden to... I have to say, this interview with this Turk has been so obsequious. He's been, he's all been almost embarrassingly sycophantic throughout this interview, so... ...to remain on the sidelines. Nonetheless, uh, I think BSF Day 2 is off to a very strong start, thanks to you, the former Prime Minister of Great Britain and Northern Ireland and the Executive Chairman of the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. Tony Blair, thank you so much. You see, so much of what he said was correct in that, and and yet we're still so far away. I, I'm for, I, I have to admit I'm frustrated because I, I feel like leaders on that level, leaders on, on the Blair level, actually understand like 90, 95% of the stuff that we talk about. It's just that they fundamentally have this progressivism at the heart of their vision. Um, if only we could get them to uh, agree with us, and the world should be the world would be so different. There wouldn't need to be any great upheaval or any any great circulation of elites if they just tweaked a few things. We already we already have that ruling class, but um, anyway, anyway, it will take people more influential than me to change their minds. I'm sure. Um, let us hit some uh, super chats. Then there's been quite a few of them. I do like to do these Dark Lord streams uh, occasionally. Uh, you know, they're a special occasion when I do them. But uh, when I saw that one, I was like, I, I have to do a Dark Lord watch for there. Cringe Walker said, very interesting how he wanted to say democracy was bad, uh, was a, has a bad name, but he edited himself to, see, to say it's been challenged. He's having inner conflicts. Uh, it, it, yes, indeed. Um, but I think that from the... Um, from the uh, the substance of what he was saying, that whole interview was a critique of democracy. You know, that for, for about 30 or 40 minutes, he, he basically talked about the shortcomings of our system and what he would do uh, if he did really have unlimited power. Um, although what Bl Blair always downplays his own influence and his own power, uh, if you haven't noticed, by the way. He always, he always plays coy when it comes to his actual his actual influence on things. Uh, Cringe Walker also says, Putin treats the Russian constitution as his baby uh, that he wants to see outlast him. He's also a fellow autist and treats it like one of us would treat the code that we wrote. Not morality. He just really cares. The constitution is his heir. Yeah, I, I would like to see Putin um, sod all of that legalism, Cringe Walker, and to embrace a kind of Schmittian czarism um, where he recognizing where he recognizes basically sovereign is he 
who makes the exception. Sovereign is he who interprets. Um, and <laughs> unfortunately, with with Putin sticking to this kind of legal fiction, um, he's tying himself up in knots. And especially if he is the only person who cares about it, like what's the point? He's he's losing this war now, as far as I'm concerned, and he's losing it because of his own his own boomerisms. Basically, it's his own that that's Putin's own boomer truth coming back to haunt him, and he needs to throw that off. I mean, the neocons don't think in that way. The neocons are just like they're all out Carl Schmidt whenever they do anything. Um, um, you can read it. In fact, Alan de Benoit and Paul Gottfried both have books on war. I think Gottfried is a collection of essays called War and Democracy. And uh, Alan de Benoit's is called uh, Carl Schmidt Today. And they're both basically Schmittian critiques of the neocons showing basically how schmitty and they are in the way that they behave and um i think putin needs to learn from that i think putin needs to you know stop trying to hold himself to a to a higher standard and just fucking go for it uh i i don't i don't i don't really understand any argument um against that from the russian point of view um uh, Noyetia says the third incarnation of Putin is brutal and based. Tony Blair, 2022. It's telling Putin was first hailed as a man who understands the West, and now he's turned against them. Maybe he truly does. Um, I, I mean, I think that Putin um, displeased Blair and friends when he turned on the oligarchs. That was the turning point. Uh, I, I would say. Um, the second incarnation of Putin, as Blair put it, that was the point where they they had Putin earmarked as a as a boogeyman because, of course, the oligarchs are their friends. So um, there we go. I am not pro Ukrainian genocide. Don't talk rubbish. I'm just saying that from the Russian point of view, I don't know why they're doing this legal legalistic bollocks. They should they should actually think more like the neocons when it comes to their own objectives. I mean, this is like, this, I mean, look at look at Blair, who we've been spent this whole stream on. Did George Bush or Tony Blair have any bloody hang-ups at all about doing the shit that they did in Iraq and Afghanistan? They went through the they went through the kind of um, you know the 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 motions of trying to get UN approval and all of that. But when push comes to shove. They were like, no, we're just going to fucking do this. They didn't say, oh, this is a special operation in Iraq or, um, you know, this is a this is an anti-terrorist. Uh, this is an anti-terrorist limited operation. They were just like, no, fuck it. This is a war. In a, this is a war. We're, we're, we're going to do it. So it's so in a strange way, uh, Bush and Blair are more based than Putin, if you want to put it in that in, in those terms. Because they're they're not they're not playing these they're not playing by those stupid childish games, and I I would just say that um, I would say that Putin needs to just just stop playing and start uh, start being serious now. You know I, I don't know why he bothers with this stuff. Who does he impress? Like wh who? What Putin supporter is going to not vote for him if he calls it a war as opposed to a special operation? I, I don't get it. Um, it, even on the Duran, they were asking this question. Even on the Duran, they asked that question. So I'm surely not the only one who who, who says this. Uh, Glow in the Dark says, The Dark Lord from his high tower came down to the masses to bestow his wisdom and twisted lies. Blair thus set out a decree, let the masses have less and focused on the future of his design, promising much good to come. Just look at the graphs, he said. Yes, indeed, uh, Glow in the Dark. He also says one thing wrong with the Anglosphere, the focus on capital other than people. All is set to increase capital at the expense of all other considerations, which is why feminism, sexual revolution, immigration and foreign manufacturing was all embraced, which has weakened the West. Look at the UK rail system. He says the people in the West used, used to be the rider in capital bureaucratic system. Now we have become the horse. Rich are not immune. They have no dedication to the countries uh, that they live in and see them as a way of the global market, which is the point of the state to protect people from foreign and domestic abuse. 
Um, it, w w what I would say, uh, glow in the dark, is that this is another problem of Blair's view of using the government to transform the people into what needs to be done, because it is very much making the the people the horse as opposed to the rider. Um, Blair's Blair's vision of the world is very deterministic, and it's and it actually strips. Uh, pe individuals and nations and governments of agency, and it turns them into the instruments of destiny. It's it's a very very strange, very very strange um, ideology, I think, and well, we need to break out of it sooner rather than later. Uh, for, for all concerned, the Holocon record says, "Thank you so much for Batman Week. Sorry you never got to finish it. I am once again recommending Brave and the Bold." Special thanks to having Chuck Dixon on. Wish I had been there to ask him about G.I. Joe. Glad to see he was doing well and still getting work. Cheers. That's from Holocom Records, and he sent 50 US dollars. Well, better late than never, Holocom Records. I'm glad you enjoyed Batman Week. It was some months ago now, but uh, I, I needed to do that. Every once in a while, I get something in my system that I need to get out of my system. I can tell you now, I have the Looney Tunes in my system, so there's going to be... Uh, at least just one stream on Looney Tunes in the near future. But um, anyway, thank you so much for that. Very generous. Though in the Dark says, I remember stories of how people, even merchants, would dedicate themselves to their fellow citizens. True, they abused foreigners more, but at least they cared more than they do today. Um, also, Blair always sets himself and his goals as the center or, or, or the good position. Uh, y yes, he does glow in the dark. And uh, I agree. I just think that the whole mindset needs to shift from, uh, as, you, as you quite rightly say, the people serving the system to the system serving the people. It's not very, you know, um, but it really does require a total mindset shift in people like Blair. And it's probably too late for him. You know, he's almost 70 now. Um, but, uh, you know, anybody watching this stream, use whatever influence you have in your life to try to try to stop this way of thinking. Because it, it leads to nowhere good. It's, I mean, look at look at us now in 2022. It's, it's just a, you know, it's, it's leading us off the edge of the cliff. Um, Glow in the Dark also says Blair wants a monopoly on the market through the state partnered with major corporations. I understand the state and the market is not separate, but you need to have wiggle room. No man can predict the future 100% of the time. You need independent companies and people. Well, yes, this is another problem with Blair's view, which is that he thinks. He thinks that people can always predict what the future is going to look like. Uh, and, and he actually sees that future as inevitable, whereas, whereas in reality, the future is not predictable. This is like Mises 101, basically. But one of the, one of the real hearts of managerialism is a kind of risk-averse um, version of the world where they get to manage all eventualities. Um, he's he's a bit of a knob end on Twitter, it has to be said. But um, I always remember the Nazim Taleb books were good on this, um, especially uh, Anti Fragile. That was a, that was a good book uh, from a few years back, which talks about this exact problem. Uh, he calls it the um, Soviet Harvard model, which is a bit, bit of a boomerish way of putting it. But um, th this is a problem that this this managerial um view that you, that you that you can perfectly predict what the future is going to look like and simply all the role of the government is is to prepare people for that um it's it's a we do need to accept that we don't know what the future is going to look like and that um there's such a thing as contingency that is either you know the black swan event or something that we don't see coming uh but, uh, but obviously Blair doesn't want to hear that. Um, uh, Glow in the Dark says, Blair believes in Blair utopia. All should be the same and you can import all the workers you need. This will enable Blair to print money to spend a uh, number go up good. No need to appeal to little English people and their traditions. Uh, y yes, indeed. I mean, that's another utopian element in this thinking that you can just continually just replace the local population and think that um, things are going to keep on working as well as they as well as they did before. But I think we're seeing all over Europe and especially in America and it's, uh, it's great cities like Philadelphia and Memphis and Detroit before them and 
uh, you know, all over California. Um, we're seeing it's not true. It's just not true. The, uh, the people of the world are not just replaceable parts. There are qualitative as well as quantitative differences between them. Um, but this is something that I don't think this ruling class is ever fully going to admit. So unfortunately, we're going to need to clear them out and we're going to need to circulate them. Uh, but as I said earlier on, I don't believe that's ever going to be possible in uh, in the UK. Uh, I just think they have too, too good a uh, containment mechanism for it, basically. But uh, it's happening in Europe. I mean, look at Sweden. It's it's uh, politics have changed dramatically um, in the past twenty years. Dramatically, they've changed, uh, as has uh, politics in America. But uh, unfortunately, uh, the the U the UK is one of their strongholds for a very good reason. Um, Glow in the dark says the reason he likes the European Union is that it makes it harder to get away from his governance. Uh, if you can get away from, uh, if you can't get away, you will eventually accept it. Blair won't admit that because if he did. It means his system isn't for everyone. Only bad people would dislike his system. Blair's system seems fascist. I mean, that's another way of putting it. But uh, yeah, I mean, the third way, the third position, uh, they're basically, they're not a million miles away from each other. It's just that they differ in uh, some of their end visions, let's just say. Um, Glenn the Dark also says, the problem with a loss of enlightened thought or, of, uh, or Blair thought is that humans need to live. We run on instinct and the metaphysical as much as our rational thoughts. We can't describe it because it speaks to something that isn't a physical phenomenon. Uh, he also says, he sent a lot of super chats all in a row. Um, look at what the futurists thought uh, of the future from 1910. They have a bit of that boomer take on tech. Might give some insight. Also, Thomas Edison's thoughts on the future. He is more realistic. Uh, yes, indeed. I think the boomer worship of tech has been uh, has been bad. Uh, Thomas Cochran says, interesting fact, Russia and Japan are still at war on a technicality, but Russia and Ukraine aren't. Look it up. So, so there we go. Apparently, Russia and uh, Japan are at war. Uh, <laughs> um, let me just very quickly have a look at the other super chats here before we get... <coughs> out of here uh <coughs> they attack the throat they attack the throat um <clears throat> oh there's been quite a few here as well js says why don't we have a dark lord where are our dark lords uh yes that's a good question uh jd uh, they're all currently being jailed in america js they're all being rounded up by the fbi and thrown into jail uh, like Steve Bannon, he was meant to be one of our dark lords. JD says Tony Blair always looks like he's one wrong turn from declaring the first Blairite empire and setting off his own Order sixty six. Yes, quite right, quite right. Uh, that that is what uh, the in intoxicating um, acid of power does to a man. I, I, I think um, Judge Caligula Bushman says. Mia Shire debunks this myth of no democracies have ever been at war in his book, The Great Delusion. The great, that's The Great Delusion, yet another good book with the word delusion in the title. Um, he says, at least five cases disprove this. Uh, E.I. bore wars. So there we go. Um, yes, yeah, so it's not even true that no democracies have been at war. Uh, and don't forget, there was a... What did they used to say? Oh... No two countries with a McDonald's have ever been at war. Well, Russia did have a McDonald's at the start of this one, and then they pulled out. So, but, you know, that was another bit of bullshit, wasn't it? Uh, Matty Ice says, Blair, such and such is why democracy is so important. Also, people are idiots. Populism destroys my work. 100% <laughs> true. Um, Parmesan uh, Valajan says, I'm being seduced by him. Be careful, Parmesan. That's why I talk on these streams to stop the to stop you being hypnotized by the all the you know the Blair blades and the steeple fingers and the you know the the, the, the fist point and all all his other special moves. Um, be careful. If you stare at the Dark Lord, Lord too long, you will be. Uh, he's like Car from the Jungle Book. You know, he'll you'll start your eyes will start going. Uh, Cringe Walker says, "Will do." Uh, and then a little. Uh, 
little uh, yes, cringe Walker, please, please do send the populist delusion to Tony Blair. I, I want him. It, I tell you what, if Blair reads the populist delusion, that will be uh, probably all my lifetime ambitions fulfilled. Um, Two Apocalypse says 50, 50 English pounds sterling, and it's just a little sticker doing a little doing a little victory and saying super effective. So thank you very much for that, Two Apocalypse. Uh, Yorkie One says this is very triggering. Um, well, I mean, you need to be brought face to face with what it is that the ruling class believe. Uh, fellow Ethelward says, can you please do a stream on male female Zuma media with guests to discuss how, since 2000, Blair and Bush have brainwashed them to hate Russia? Um, yes, but I don't know anybody from Zuma media, fellow Ethelward. I don't know anybody. I hate Zoomers. I hate most people. Cringe Walker says, I'm curious why he insists on being called Prime Minister of Great Britain and Northern Ireland versus just the UK. Is there a reason? Yes, Cringe Walker. Yes, I, yes, there is a reason. Blair sees the Northern Ireland peace settlement as one of his greatest achievements. Um, and if you want the full lowdown on that, track down my cigar stream with Thomas 777 and Lady of Shalott, where we where we discussed it at some length. Um, yeah, that that was he saw that as one of his crown jewels. Uh, uh, you know, in the, in his ten years of destruction, uh, they they bigged it up massively on the big uh, changing of the guard between him and Brown in two thousand seven as well. A deplorable patriarch says, "Sadly, we are now eighty years into Operation Barbarossa, and twenty five years into the Blair Project in the UK." And both have hit some stumbling blocks. Just the first century of the thousand-year plan, though. Yeah, I know, deplorable patriarch. I mean, this is the, the this I think is yes, it's true that we do need long-term planning, but also like, should you change all of reality to conform to your thirty-year plan? I mean, like, but Blair just has this view that the future is inevitable, but then in a strange way. He wants every arm of the government working to ensure that future happens in a strange way. Um, so it's a it's a curiously circular logic in the, in the way in the way that he he formulates it. Um, and it's kind of pointless as well. It's like, well, why do you want this, Blair? You want you, you, the future is going to change. There's nothing that stop it. But we must transform everything to get ready for it. But what if we don't want it? What if we don't want that future? Different possibilities are available. Not 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 in Blair's way of thinking. Um, Road Crusader says it's always good to see you do another Tony Blair stream. How can one so evil be so constantly right? Oh well, that's the thing. You see, that's the thing. Ninety five percent right, but that five percent that I've been highlighting, uh, you know, that we disagree on is is very very significant. Um, Yitramis says. If even the dark Blair, uh, if even the dark Lord Blair ultimately serves the political zeitgeist of progressivism, who or what is the overlord controlling the narrative? Um, I, well, I don't believe there is an, I, I don't believe there necessarily is an overlord controlling the narrative. Uh, what it is, is that they all believe in this kind of mythical telos, this kind of, you know, where the future's going. But then they see to it that that future happens. So it's a it's a very it's a very curious thing, um, and I do believe that Blair, alter, like for all his cynicism, does believe in that part of the vision. I think they all do. Bill Gates, the lot of them, um, you know, they believe this progressive telos, and that is the thing that I believe that we must break. Um, it's not enough to break the populist delusion. Uh, this is why I'm writing three books. This is why I'm writing. Prophets of Doom to break the, the the myth of progress, and then I'm going to write uh, the Boomer Truth regime to break anything that's left over in the Boomer Truth way of seeing see, seeing the world, um, which is uh, it, it's which is actually more than just the myth of progress and the populist delusion. Um, there are many other elements to it as well, um, some of which are quite edgy and quite difficult to talk about. Uh, and I have to think about a way of formulating it that's not going to be too alienating to the uninitiated let's just say um how i'm going to cross the bridge of uh 
not calling the Nazis the ultimate evil is that's going to be tricky to navigate. But uh, I'll find a way. I'll find a way. Um, uh, <laughs> Monothalmos says, "Doesn't Blair being driven by progressivism lead some credence to the idea that, as Yarvin asserts, there is a level above the power of money?" Um, I we see. I don't believe that that progressive that progressive vision though is one that is was given to Blair by university or by his education or the media or anything like that. Um, it's uh, so that can be true without power ultimately resting in the media, if that makes any sense. Um, it's hard to locate the actual source of that progressive vision. Um, it may be something much more difficult, like uh, what Spengler might call like the, 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 the bio spirit of the people or something. I mean, ultimately, Blair's view is a version of Faustianism. It's a Faustian vision. It's a, it's a, it's a vision that doesn't respect like limits or it just sees like this never ending growth never-ending technological change driving more and more growth, more and more quantity. Um, and so, so ultimately, that's a spirit, that is a spiritual problem um, that would persist, I would say, regardless of what is written in the media, regardless of who controls media, uh, regardless of who, who's in charge of the, uh, you know, of the money power, etc., this requires a really fundamental uh, rethinking from the ground up of what it is that um, what it is that our people stand for, ultimately. Uh, you know, and you know, m much smarter people than me have have, uh, have tried and failed to overturn that in the past, including Guanon, Evola, Spengler. Uh, Many at Yoki, many, many writers have um, tried and failed to overturn this aspect of uh, European thinking, basically. Um, back, because I believe with Blair, that's what we're dealing with. Um, yes, there are sectional interests. Yes, there are ethnic interests. Um, yes, there are uh, malign forces who control the money supply and all the rest of it. But that problem I'm talking about is a much deeper spiritual problem that it, that goes to the heart of who Europeans are. Um, and we talked about it a bit at the event, you know. I would like to, through people like Carlyle and others uh, and Spengler, get away from the frontier and the vision of, uh, the kind of Faustian vision of unlimited growth and towards the Shire, basically, and the idea that... Uh, the idea that we build structures that endure and that the non-change of things, the constancy of things, the fact that it doesn't change, the fact that after the queen dies, the king reigns, or the fact that after the king reigns, long live the king, that continuity, um, or the fact that, uh, you know, uh, your father ran the farm and before him his father ran the farm and before him his father ran the farm or sam serves master frodo and before him sam's father served master frodo's father or whatever whatever this this is the, a different way of thinking a more traditional way of thinking uh the way of the shire as opposed to the way of um i guess what you'd say the scouring of the shire I mean, I, we we started the stream with um, this <clears throat> this here, but, but, but in a strange way, Tolkien, who created the archetype of the of Saruman and his industrialism and his orcs, was also talking about this. The struggle for the soul of Europe is between the the unlimited the techno Faustianism of Saruman and the permanence and constancy um, of, of something like the Shire. So, and I'm trying to sell <laughs> in a way, or trying to get people to uh, prefer that vision of the Shire to the, uh, to the unlimited growth 
unlimited technological change model. That would be a genuine traditionalism as opposed to uh, kind of false conservatism that we've had for so many years. Baxter McTavish says, new Canadian Conservative Party leader vows that none of his cabinet will be allowed to attend World Economic Forum events. Yeah, I mean, okay, that's good. That's good, Baxter McTavish. But, like, will they also be stopped from attending the Bled Strategic Forum? Will they, you know, will that mean that they don't listen to what the Dark Lord has to say, you know, at uh, some other event that he attends? Because, it, you see, this is the thing. The focus on the WEF as the WEF, as being, like, the center of the octopus, is a very superficial analysis, isn't it? Because uh, it doesn't actually account for what the World Economic Forum is, which is just another one of these conferences where these people gather. Um, it, it, I would be much uh, happier if the new Canadian Conservative Party leader, um, you know, was saying some of the things that I've been saying on this street uh, and, and, and encouraging his cabinet to think in a really fundamentally different way about um, the way things are going. You know, uh, so anyway, yes, the, this stream is a bonus, William Turner. It's a, it's a bonus stream. All right. I think that's uh, that's it. That was the last of the Super Chats. I will just uh, refresh Entropy to make sure I've missed none of those. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this stream. Well, we'll be back tomorrow night for Unpopular Opinions, where uh, D and a host of all British, that is, uh, from, you know, England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. Um, people from those four great countries uh, will be discussing uh, the sad passing of the Queen, uh, her legacy, and uh, the future reign of King Charles. Uh, so we'll be back tomorrow at 9pm. As I said, the David Bowie stream is um, currently under a copyright review and maybe back or maybe I'll have to re-edit it and upload it. Uh, we won't find that out until probably Wednesday, but I'll let you know on my community tab when that's back up and running. Uh, buy a course at the Academic Agency, join the channel, buy a mug, pick up the Populist Illusion, buy a copy of Populist Illusion and send it to Tony Blair. Um, that also would be appreciated. And I'll see you again. Now get out. What goes on in this town is none of your business. As long as I'm living here, it is. Then maybe you shouldn't be living here! Well, that's...